大家好，那我们下面这个报告，那个因为朱迪佩尔的那个网络还是有点问题，所以我们下面报告呢，有请哥伦比亚大学的教授、数据科学研究院的院长周以珍教授，呃，也是 j e n e t Wen， 他的那个报告的题目呢是 Data for Good i n s u r a n c e 周以珍，美籍华人女性科学家，现为哥伦比亚大学数据科学研究院院长。美国国家自然基金会计算与信息科学工程部助理部长，美国国家自然基金会计算与信息科学工程部助理部长 ，ACM Fellow，I Triple E Fellow， 在周以珍的众多成就中，他于2006年发表的计算思维是最为人称道的成果之一。周以珍倡导运用计算机科学的基础概念解决问题。设计系统并理解人类行为的思维方式，这一理念推动了计算机科学在全球教育领域的发展。巾帼不让须眉，周以珍既最新教研，又广泛学习其他知识，涉猎武术、舞剑、芭蕾舞等诸多领域，多才多艺，被广大学生称为“才华横溢的龙女”。目前，周以珍教授的研究方向为可信赖计算。重点集中于安全和隐私等方面。Okay, so Jinati, are you ready? So you can share your screen. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Excellent. So that was quite an introduction. <laughs> you you looked hard for those pictures. I'm impressed. <clears throat> so I um we're since we're running late, I will get us back on time. Uh, since it's late for me, uh, and uh, let's just begin. So I'm going to talk about the Data Science Institute at Columbia University, but more importantly, I'm going to talk about data science and how we can use data for good. By that I mean ensuring the responsible use of data to benefit society. Before I begin to dive into the details, I want to give you a big, bigger picture of what I mean by the data life cycle. Of course, we start with generating data. We generate. We've been the scientists have been generating data for for decades using large scientific instruments. Think large hadron collider, large telescopes. Uh, neutrino detectors in the South Pole, and so on. I think what's most exciting and recent in terms of data generation is, of course, data that we generate, people generate, and that companies and others collect about us. After generating data, we collect it.、Uh, we don't always collect all the data that we generate. We process the data that we collect. By processing, I mean everything from encryption to compression to More mundane things like data wrangling,、um, data cleaning. We store the data. We store the data in such a way that we can retrieve the data efficiently. That's where database management techniques come in.、Uh, and then we do analysis. It's in an analysis that I think is of great interest to the audience here because that's where AI and machine learning come to play.、Uh, And then, of course, it's not enough to analyze the data. You have to visualize the results, and that's where data visualization comes in. And I think it wasn't really until I joined Columbia University when I came to appreciate that it's not just about data visualization, but it's also about data interpretation, telling a story to the end user to understand the results of the data analysis. And of course, throughout the entire data lifecycle, we care a lot about privacy and ethics. What is data science? This is a,、um, a topic of large debate among the academic community,、uh, industry, and even government. I have a very short definition of what data science is. It's the study of extracting value from data. The two most important words in this definition are value and extracting. Value really says that the Uh, value of the data that we're extracting from、uh, is subject to the interpretation of the end user. So the value to a scientist is advancing new knowledge. The value to a business is actually bottom line, 
every time you click on an ad, you're making money. And so a business person can actually calculate the value of data. The value to a policymaker is to use data to make data-driven decisions. The other word that's important in this definition is extracting. It takes a lot of effort to get that value. All the phases of the data life cycle hints as, as to what kind of effort is needed. So I want to now talk a little bit about the Data Science Institute at Columbia University because it's, it is quite a distinctive and unique institute. It's a university level and a university wide institute. I have a three part mission statement. The first is to advance the state of the art in data science. This is really about pushing the frontiers of basic research in a field that itself is new and emerging. The second is to transform all fields, professions, and sectors through the application of data science. This mission statement speaks to the breadth of Columbia University. We are a full-fledged university um, and we represent all fields, professions, and sectors. And finally, the title of my talk, Ensure the Responsible Use of Data to Benefit Society. This really has two parts itself. Using data to benefit society means addressing societal grand challenges like climate change, healthcare, energy, and a topic of great interest to, to um, us in the United States right now is social justice. Ensure the responsible use of data speaks to the privacy and ethical concerns that we as data scientists must consider from day one and not after the fact. So my tagline is data for good, using data to do good for society and using data in a good way. As I mentioned, we are a university level and university wide institute. We collaborate with all 17 schools, colleges and institutes across the entire university from architecture and art to all the departments in arts and sciences, even Barnard College and Teachers College and of course, all the different uh, schools in the medical center, uh, the Physicians and Surgeons College, School of Nursing, Dental School, Public Health, um, and then other schools on campus like uh, the Law School, the Public Policy School, the Journalism School, the Business School, and of course, all the departments in the Engineering School. So we have over 350 faculty affiliated with the Data Science Institute. It truly is uh, collaborative and multidisciplinary. We roughly have a few centers that are thematic. Um, I'll just point out a few, health analytics, financial analytics, uh, computational social science. Um, at Columbia University, we define the foundations of data science on three pillars of strength, computer science, statistics, and operations research. Columbia has a very strong operations research into the engineering school and has a very strong operations research group in the business school. And so uh, Columbia is very well known for OR. We have a program that is joint with the Columbia Entrepreneurship Program that fosters collaboration in education where faculty from different departments to come together and they design and teach courses that otherwise would never be taught. Uh, the one that uh, in the upper left is co-taught by an applied math professor and a history professor. And it basically is a, an easy introduction to data science for all students. Another interesting uh, collaboration is with the business school. Right now, um, the business school has easily over 50% of its graduates graduating with some data science knowledge. Uh, I think this speaks to the students know what the future is. We have a robust industry affiliates program uh, and it's, it represents multiple sectors, pharmaceutical, retail, finance, IT of course, uh, and, and publishing and other sectors. You'll notice that we have three Chinese companies, uh, very prominent comp companies, Alibaba, Baidu, and DD. Uh, so we are international as well. We have a special center with IBM. This is a special relationship with IBM. 
and specifically on blockchain and data transparency. So we have uh, affiliations with many companies, but we also have um, bigger relationships with a few companies as well. So now what I wanted to do is spend a little time telling you about some of the uh, research that we do in the Data Science Institute. And I'm gonna key off the mission statement. I'm only going to talk about one story uh, with respect to advancing the state of the art in data science and touch on a few fields which, where data science is being used on campus. And then a, a, a few um, stories on ensuring the responsible use of data to benefit society. So let me start with multiple causal inference. Had Udaya Pearl uh, given his keynote before me, I'm sure he would have talked about causal inference. This work uh, looks at something a little different. It's on multiple causal inference. And if you think about it, uh, many situations are where there are multiple causes that might, might uh, um, have an effect on the outcome. And it turns out that solving the multiple causal inference problem is actually slightly easier than the classical causal inference problem. But let me set this up uh, with an example. So uh, suppose I'm a producer and I want to understand the causal effect of putting an actor into a movie. I have to make casting decisions and I want to predict the expected revenue. If I put Sean Connery in a James Bond movie, will I make more money than if I put in Roger Moore? So my goal is what's in the red box. I want to estimate the expected revenue given a particular cast A. That is, I want to estimate the population distribution um, Y of A and thus for a particular cast A, um, I want to estimate the expected outcome. In the Udaya Pearl um, notation, this would be written in the do calculus like that. Now, multiple causal inference has many applications. Uh, uh, how do genes affect a trait? The causes are genes, the effect is a trait. How do sports players affect how well a team is doing? The causes are who is in the game. The effect is the points scored in the game. How do prices of items affect how much money is spent? The causes are the prices of each item for sale. The effect is how much money is spent. Now, there's one problem with causal inference that is we all understand, and it's confounders. Confounders affect the causes and the outcomes. For example, the genre will affect what actors I put in the movie, the causes, and it will affect the revenue outcome. Um, action movies are more popular than artsy movies. Whether a movie is a sequel or not is another confounder. So in classical causal inference, we correct for all confounders, which requires in theory that we measure all confounders. This is also known, oops. This is also known as the strong ignorability assumption that we have we assume that there are no unobserved confounders. If we assume that there are no unobserved confounders, then we can calculate or an estimate of the causal effects. But this assumption is, un, is famously untestable. And, but that's how, that's how we do causal inference today. So this is a little unsatisfying. So the problem of multiple causal inference allows us to weaken the assumption and actually come up with a procedure that's testable. So the new idea is to create what's called a deconfounder. And operationally, one fits a local latent variable model of the assigned causes and infer the latent variable uh, for each data point. It is the substitute confounder. Correct for the substitute confounder in causal inference um, and then calculate as, as normal. There is an assumption, and that assumption is that there's no unobserved single cause confounder. It's a weaker assumption, but there's still an assumption. The beauty of this approach is that one can actually uh, build a model and, and check uh, whether it's good or not by some definition that we uh, give as good. So if we don't like the model, we can build a different one. Um, and then theoretically, one can prove that the deconfounder 
constructed as defined gives unbiased causal inference. So back to movies. Um, in this example, if with the deconfounder, Sean Connery's value goes up and the characters, the actors who play the characters M and Q, their values go down. What this means that is that without the deconfounder, Sean Connery's value is underestimated and the actors who play M and Q, their values were overestimated. And intuitively this makes sense. We go to see a James Bond movie because Sean Connery's in it. He's, he's one of the favorite James Bond uh, actors. Uh, we unfortunately don't usually remember who the actors who play M and Q are. Once we have a deconfounder, because we're talking about causal inference, we can ask, uh, answer lots of other what if questions. And that's another beauty of uh, building the deconfounder. Well, let me just summarize that the deconfounder corrects for unobserved confounders. Uh, like genre, sequel, and so on, um, but there is still a weak assumption. So now let me turn to um, how data science is transforming many fields, professions, and sectors throughout the university through the application of data science. Let me start with a field that's pretty obvious, and that's, of course, biology. Um, biology has had big data for decades, uh, I would say, starting from the sequencing of the human genome. In this particular example, the researchers looked at the genome of the microbiome surrounding a pancreatic tumor uh, cells, uh, cancer tumor cells. And they found that the microbiome counteracted the effect of the chemotherapy that was treating the tumor. So this is very, not good because it basically says a microbiome is making the chemotherapy ineffective. But they went further and saw that if you inject the tumor with an antibiotic, then that would counter effect the effect of the microbiome, therefore making the chemotherapy treatment effective. So this is done for mice, it's not been done yet for humans. Another science that of course has big data is cosmology and astronomy. In this particular work, uh, not surprisingly, the astronomers like to use state-of-the-art techniques from any field to tackle their big data problems. And so they used uh, convolutional neural networks to see if they could uh, better understand the image data they get from weak gravitational lensing. It turns out that using convolutional neural networks allowed them to estimate the coefficients of the Big Bang model um, much more precisely than off-the-shelf statistical methods. They, this is a typical uh, result from neural networks today where we see that they give us good results, but we don't actually understand why. Uh, turning to a different field in economics, Economics and machine learning have been uh, converging in multiple ways in the past few years. Uh, economics, as you know, is very concerned with causal inference, uh, not just correlation, uh, whereas machine learning gives you a lot of ways to analyze big data, but is shy to say anything about causality. So I think one of the um, uh, observations I made when I was at Microsoft is how the combination of economics and big data and machine learning algorithms could really move both fields forward uh, and, and actually have an impact on the company. In this particular work, uh, we are looking at online marketplaces, labor markets like Amazon Mechanical Turk. And what they did is use a, a, a technique called double machine learning to show that these online labor markets behave more like monopsonies than any kind of uh, competitive marketplace. A monopsony is where you have one buyer and multiple sellers, unlike a monopoly where you have one seller and multiple buyers. In a completely different field in finance, um, this is where you can imagine personal investors uh, being replaced by 
robots and using reinforcement learning, much like Russ talked about yet, uh, in his previous talk, using reinforcement learning to learn the preferences of the investor. So we could, with a robo-advisor, completely dispense with a human advisor. Um, and this work actually shows that through uh, this uh, reinforcement learning process, one can actually learn an investor's preferences after uh, eight or nine iterations of the algorithm. Much, much faster than what it takes a human to learn, which is months or years. In history, we have, of course, lots and lots of data documents that are collected over the years. And this history professor and his team built what's called a history lab, where they collect documents, including declassified documents um, from, from the United States. Uh, and they have the biggest collection of declassified documents. Um, and in this particular work, they were looking to see if they could use off-the-shelf machine learning techniques and uh, data science techniques like topic modeling and sentiment analysis and so on to see if they could retroactively, uh, just by analyzing the text of the documents, discover the interesting events, discover the historical events. So what they did here in this particular work was look at all the cablegrams that were sent by the diplomats around the world uh, in, the, in the 1970s. And sure enough, they were able to discover some interesting events. Um, and interesting but being defined as not business as usual. So you'll recognize a couple of every black dot here is an interesting event. So you'll recognize a couple like the evacuation of Saigon and the death of Mao Zedong. So now let me turn to the two senses of data for good, the responsible use of data, I'll start with. Um, here, you know, the community has for a long time already now been talking about fat star, fairness, accountability, and transparency in AI and machine learning and, and uh, data science more generally. Uh, my colleagues at Microsoft Research New York City added the E for fate, uh, E for ethics, um, but I actually think we need to go beyond fairness, accountability, and transparency and build on what the commu computer science community has been talking about for a long time, uh, trustworthy computing. Um, but for AI, we have to worry not just about the uh, standard properties of trustworthiness, which I list below, but also new properties like fairness and robustness and interpretability and explainability. So canonical properties of trustworthy computing include safety, security, privacy, reliability, availability, and usability. Of course, we want our AI systems to have those properties, but we ha also have um, other properties that are germane to AI and their uses. So let me just talk about safety and uh, I'll mention a little bit about robustness with respect to privacy, uh, uh, using, using a, a privacy notion. Let me start with safety. This is a deep learning system um, that, uh, this is a, a system that tests deep learning systems and uh, they look for specifically uh, errors uh, that the deep learning system could make that would be misclassification errors. Um, in particular, they are inspired by two software engineering techniques. One is called code coverage and the other is differential testing. And they use these two techniques to define a, an algorithm um, that basically compares uh, two different DNNs and shows how um, one can uh, modify the inputs in such a way that you can get the DNN to uh, misclassify uh, a changed image. So in particular, if you see the image to the left, um, that's a typical image that a self-driving car might uh, 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 have to act on and it will uh, correctly, uh, the car will steer to the left. But if you slightly darken the image, then the DNN will uh, unfortunately uh, uh, make a wrong classification um, and the, tell the car to swerve to the right, go through the guardrail and over the cliff and you die. 
So the point really is that the system is able to find perturbations to inputs that will uh, uh, make the DNN do the wrong thing. And in this particular system, they found thousands of fatal errors in 15 state-of-the-art DNNs for ImageNet for self-driving cars. And it goes beyond just images and cars, uh, also for traditional uh, malware found in PDF and Android files. Um, a second piece of work, uh, which it really actually speaks to robustness of DNNs, um, is inspired by the notion of differential privacy uh, that has come out of the community uh, in, in the privacy community and the theoretical computer science community. And the uh, insight here is, can, is, is to add a layer of noise in a DNN that can then guarantee that the DNN classifier will be robust to any set of perturbations. In this particular case, it's a provable guarantee. So as long as you know that your perturbations to the input image is within that, um, within the stability bounds, then you are guaranteed that uh, the classifier will uh, classify the image correctly. Uh, this is actually quite a novel idea because it's taking this concept, differential privacy, and inserting it uh, in a uh, context of use for actually showing DNNs can be made robust in a provable way. Now let me talk, turn to a couple of societal grand challenges that uh, data scientists at Columbia have been tackling. One is actually the combination of climate and agriculture. Here the data scientists were trying to understand the effect of the changes of the monsoon season in India uh, with respect to how the, uh, uh, it would have impact the growing of different grains. Uh, in India, uh, much, of the, um, much of the crops, the grains grown is rice and much of the food that people eat is, is rice. And the point of this uh, study was to show that India um, may be vulnerable if there's too much dependency on just rice. And so in particular, um, if India's crop production continues to homogenize toward rice, then the food supply in the country may be more vulnerable to increasingly frequent climate shocks like droughts and extreme heat. And also the other thing that um, people are observing with respect to climate change is that the monsoon seasons can be, um, can change in their periodicity and also in the amount, the volume of water that uh, falls in each uh, season. So the extremes uh, are, um, are much greater. Um, and this is something that of course India is uh, monitoring. Uh, the other main result of this work is basically saying in that increasing the share of production contributed by coarse cereals, such as millets and sorghum, could improve the resilience of India's food production against climatic changes, especially in the places where coarse cereal yields are already comparable to rice yields. Um, so the main point of this is by using big data, using uh, understanding how uh, climate change is affecting the country, um, then one can put in new policies with respect to what kinds of crops should be grown when and where. Uh, that would affect a policy that perhaps the government would um, institute. The last um, societal grand challenge I wanted to address uh, is uh, health care. This is, of course, a tremendous interest today, given the pandemic. Um, I'm going to talk about this particular interesting data set. It's a federated data set that Columbia University is the coordinating center of. Its goal is to have 1 billion patient records for observational research. Currently, it has 600 million um, patient records, 500 million unique patient records uh, from 25 different countries um, that basically are pulling from 80 different databases. 
and there are over 200 researchers involved in this project. I wanted to share with you some of the results uh, of looking at just the observational uh, data. This is electronic health records, essentially. I think you know this audience would greatly appreciate the fact that these 500 million unique patient records are all in the same format. Uh, once you have so many uh, files in the same format, you can really do some interesting um, analysis. So here we're looking at a beautiful visualization of some of the results. They looked at three different diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and depression. And the way to interpret one of these rings of circle, this ring of circles is that the inner ring represents the, a drug of the first line of treatment. So this orange, uh, this drug that is represented by this orange color, um, each patient is a, a, a radius of this ring of circles. If that orange drug works, then that's fine. But if it doesn't work, this, the patient is given a second drug. So for instance, this would be the representing the drug of the second uh, um, in the sequence of treatments. If that second drug doesn't work, then you're given a third drug, and that this is the third circle, a fourth drug, and so on. And the, the picture's cut off after four ring, four circles. The point is that um, it, it turns out that if, you, if I combined all the different clinics data on hypertension, we would find in this particular data set that one fourth, this is observational results now, one fourth of the people treated around the world for hypertension are treated uniquely. This is a quite a stunning result, I feel, because you would think that uh, hypertension is a, a is a co common problem and everyone who has hypertension would be treated pretty much the same. But the observational results uh, beg to differ. Another interesting result was looking at the diabetes rings of circles. And if I showed you all of them, they would all pretty much look like the, the top two. The outlier was this bottom one here. And it turns out that that uh, JMDC uh, represents a Japanese clinic. And then in pursuing uh, to try to understand why this looks different, it turns out the Japanese are genetically disposed against this metformin uh, drug. And so either it doesn't work, and you can see that other rings, uh, circles, uh, uh, drugs are needed to treat those patients, or the doctor doesn't even try. So that this is just uh, what one can get when you have a lot of data that you can analyze. I want to close by going back to deconfounders. Um, by having this notion of a deconfounder and a data set as large as uh, the one I just described, one can imagine, of course, in the medical uh, sciences, you want to do causal reasoning. So one can imagine building a deconfounder for um, using uh, the technique I described earlier for this particular database. And that's what they did. They looked at, uh, this is just one result, looking at type 2 diabetes. And I'm just going to go to the punchline. Basically, the deconfounder reduces both false positive and false negative rates. Um, so acetaminophen, for instance, goes from causal to non-causal, and two drugs um, go from uh, non-causal to causal. Um, now, it's not easy to validate these kinds of results, so they compared it to um, uh, what has been published in the medical literature, and this deconfounder, this medical deconfounder, identifies effective causal drugs that are more consistent with the medical literature. So I'm going to stop now, and if there's time for questions, I'll take one or two. But otherwise, thank you very much. Do you have some minutes uh, for question answer? I, I can take one or two. OK, so actually, I have two questions. <laughs> But anyway, followed by some other audience. So the first question actually is about privacy. Uh, we know that, okay, so the privacy is very important. And also for data science, actually data is also very important. So, so do, for example, we have some kind of algorithm, of course, for deal with, dealing with the privacy. 
like uh, federated learning or some other algorithms. So do you have some idea because you are working uh, in the data science institute, do you have some idea about the, the how to deal with the privacy issue in the data science? Well, it's a great, it's a great question. And it, it turns out that privacy is actually one of my research interests. And I also worked very closely with the researchers at Microsoft when I was at Microsoft Research in privacy. I basically bucket um, the privacy pr preserving technologies into um, three, well, maybe four approaches. The first is cryptographic approaches. And this is where you can use a secure multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption, uh, zero knowledge proofs and so on, to actually solve point solutions for point problems. And companies are doing this. So we shouldn't, although I, people, people think cryptography and they, shot and they, they run away because they, they think it's going to be inefficient. For a particular problem, one can actually use these cryptographic techniques very efficiently. Sometimes you have to combine them, but I can tell you that the Microsofts and the Googles and and so on are using these techniques um, and they scale. The second bucket of, of privacy preserving technologies, I would say, are statistical based. And this is where differential privacy comes in. Um, now, differential privacy itself, of course, was inspired by cryptographic techniques. Um, but it is an essentially um, a statistics-based argument for uh, preserving privacy. And this, of course, has its own applications. Um, and it's being used right now by Census 2020, which is a uh, account of all the Americans uh, in the United States. And it will be used. Now, there are limitations. Again, every, all these things have limitations but at least you have some provable guarantees. And I know that there's a lot of interest in combining differential privacy and the techniques of differential privacy with machine learning, and that's very active. Um, in fact, you might also want to combine differential privacy with the cryptographic techniques in a particular uh, application I, that I, I could share with you if you're interested. The third bucket is actually hardware-based techniques. These are, um, uh, uh, machine and, uh, hardware instructions like SGX that Intel put out um, that allow you to bracket a set of instructions and that guarantee will guarantee that even the operating system can't read the data that's read into that um, iron, that, that secure enclave is what it's called. Um, there are other techniques that are uh, coming from programming languages uh, that are speaking primarily for showing that privacy policies can be guaranteed in a scalable way. Um, one, can one can show, one can build tools that analyze the code, much like one would do for uh, any other kind of static analysis or dynamic analysis of code. And, and uh, with appropriate annotations, show that that code is satisfying a particular privacy policy. So I think in the machine learning community, in the AI community, um, there are ways to uh, you know, the, what I would explore are, uh, you know, when you're sharing data, you, you, the idea is that when you share data, you can build a better model. Uh, and, and then I think that the interesting thing is when you're, is to, when you're reporting back the results, that's an opportunity, for instance, for differential privacy. So um, what I'm really trying to say is one should look beyond just straight uh, machine learning techniques and and uh, be open-minded about using privacy preserving techniques okay thank you thank you very much for sharing the different ideas on privacy uh, protection and actually you talk about the industry and also you talk about the different companies that i know that you are you were working in microsoft and also before that you work in, in actually cmu so do you have any suggesting to researchers, uh, for example, to students, uh, I mean, what, what's the difference uh, uh, between the doing research in industry and, uh, and the academia? I think that most, uh, the, the high level difference is that in academia, you really get to choose what you want to work on. Um, and 
uh, you know, there's a, a concept of academic freedom where you get to choose what you want to work on uh, and you advocate for your own ideas. In industry, you, in industry, for the most part, you have to work on something that is of value to the company. Um, now, in Microsoft Research, there was a, 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 a kind of a happy um, combination of it being a fairly academic research lab where you could work on basic research that was long term. But in the end, what you worked on should accrue value to the business, to the to the company. Um, so the, the advantage of working in, in a company is that there's always uh, people who come to you with problems and say, I need help to, to help me solve this particular problem. And also the advantage of working in industrial research lab is you are the, um, the uh, basically looking ahead of where the company is to know where the company might run into problems and hopefully you have solutions. But I would say in academia, you're completely unconstrained. You can work on what you want to do. No one is your tells you what to do. Uh, you are responsible for your own self, of course, and that usually means uh, at, in the United States, it usually means writing grant proposals and getting funding for your students and even for your uh, summer salary. So okay, there are pros and cons. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Yeah. So, okay. So we actually, we have a bunch of questions from our audience. So later on, probably we will send the email to you and uh, okay. and you can you can just pick some of them and reply. So okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Good, good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye.